I never saw uh, This is the College of Complexes. We're going to open the program for announcements. Uh, sorry. We're actually. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is John Bactell. I'm the chair of the Communist Party. And uh, I'm really glad to be here. I was here, I guess I spoke in front of this group a couple years ago, and it elicited quite a little storm of uh, debate. I almost didn't make it out of my life, but I'm glad to be back. Anyway, it's good to see everybody again. And, uh, on such a nice occasion, too, as well. Um, I uh, want to thank Charlie also for inviting me to speak. And uh, yeah, this is such a great institution. Um, it's really, you know, examining all these questions, but also this vibrant culture debate that you have here. Uh, I'm really glad to be part of it. Um, as you know, I'm going to be speaking about the 100th anniversary of the uh, October Revolution. And I, uh, Charlie had, been, had passed out a pamphlet that I wrote earlier on the tipping points of capitalism, which I'm going to touch on. I'm not going to um, read from that. Uh, but I'm using that as a taking off point for some other uh, ideas that I wanted to develop a little bit more. Uh, so you can read that at your leisure. <clears throat> well, we live in a extraordinarily dangerous moment. People in nature face existential threats, including the ecological and climate crises and a growing nuclear war danger. Additionally, other looming crises uh, that are interrelated are reaching uh, what I call a tipping point that are rooted in the contradictions of capitalism and they have to be addressed. These include the threat to democracy, extreme wealth concentration and social inequality, and the impact of automation on job loss. One way or another, all will be at the center of shaping developments going forward. But I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. So first I want to share some observations on the 100th anniversary of the October Revolution and some thoughts on an American path to what I call peaceful, democratic, humane eco-socialism. The October Revolution took place during a stormy period of war and revolution. It marked the first great socialist experiment, a charting of the unknown, the first break with global, the global capitalist system, the first time that working people had been in political power. It was a historic development of immense proportions, epic proportions that reverberates to this day. From its inception, the Soviet Union's path of development was shaped and weighted down by the legacy of feudalism, monarchy, and its associated violent repression. It inherited economic backwardness, a society uh, pervasive with illiteracy, little civil society and democratic tradition or institutions, and a powerful Russian Orthodox Church intertwined with the state. It had to rebuild from the devastation of World War I, then the hostile encirclement and invasion of Western capitalist powers, including the United States, and the threat of reactionary regimes on its border. Against incredible odds, the revolution inspired hope, expanded expansive creativity, and relentless perseverance. It uh, initiated and developed the most advanced uh, constitution in the history of humanity that enshrines uh, equal rights, including for women, nationalities, and and uh, of course uh, exalted the role of workers in, in society. 
Under Lenin's leadership, after initial, initial missteps, the Soviet Union embarked on the new economic policy, also called the NEP, which was a, a mixed economy. It was a recognition that they had to retreat in order to go forward. The NEP recognized multiple forms of property, including private property, particularly in the countryside among peasants and foreign private investment. It acknowledged that class society would be a feature of socialist construction for years to come. Had Lenin lived, perhaps history would have turned out differently. But he died prematurely, and once Stalin consolidated power, this policy was scrapped in favor of forced expropriation of agricultural lands and collectivization, the centralization of power, and near total state ownership of industry. With the rise of fascism, the Soviet Union embarked on a forced march of development that spun a centralized economy and political structure, militarization, and authoritarian rule. This forced march, combined with fears of enemies, foreign and internal, took the path of near paranoia. It reached its peak with the years of terror in 1937-38 when untold numbers were executed and imprisoned, including substantial parts of the military general staff and the party leadership. Far from being an indispensable leader in the fight against fascism, Stalin actually weakened Soviet defenses and left it ill-prepared for the Nazi invasion. Much of the Soviet industrial capacity and infrastructure, cities and villages were destroyed during World War II, and 22 million people were left dead. As it attempted to rebuild from the rubble, the Soviet Union was forced to commit immense resources to the Cold War arms race and heightened competition with global capitalism. This comprised the most unfavorable set of circumstances for the world's first socialist experiment and affected every aspect of its development. The combined chaotic, desperate, and backward conditions were fertile ground for the rise of Stalin and all subsequent crimes, the gulags, imprisonment, and executions. Authoritarianism, conformity of thought, and proclamation of official dogma led to the enshrinement in the Constitution of the Communist Party as the sole governing party and the cult of personality from Stalin. The Soviet Union may have survived, but it paid an incalculable price. The image of socialism and communism, its claim to moral authority, suffered immeasurably. Because it was the first socialist revolution and its historic role in defeating fascism, the Soviet model became the pattern. Other socialist-oriented revolutions followed. It left its imprint on the entire world communist and revolutionary movements. This legacy is also an important reason socialism ultimately collapsed in the Soviet Union and Eastern, the Eastern Bloc. And despite all of the negatives, the Soviet people boast, boasted of, va of vast achievements. Modern industrial production that rivaled the U.S., the ability to feed and clothe itself, high levels of science and technology, free health care and education, universal literacy, developed arts, sports, and culture, solidarity with national liberation movements worldwide, including uh, massive investments in developing countries, the education of, of tens of thousands of uh, people, raising up the economic and cultural level of the working class and full, formerly oppressed minorities, and of course the key role in defeating fascism. But the negative material factors alone can't explain the collapse of socialism. As I said, had Lenin lived longer, or the Communist Party of the Soviet Union pursued a different set of policies, things might have turned out differently. 
The mistakes included a number of things that, that I want to mention, just a few here, including wrong assessments of the level of socialist development, an egalitarian approach, wage leveling, declaration that nationality, the nationality question had been solved, persistence of great Russian chauvinism, and the inability to transition to economic and political decentralization. The Soviet Union didn't sufficiently develop genuine grassroots forms of democracy and participation, <coughs> nor were opposition par political parties and movements or freedom of religion allowed. It relied on suppression of dissent, dissent rather than the messy battle of ideas of democratic society. The Soviet Union was never able to decisively break from this pattern of development until the reforms of the 1980s, which were at first aimed at deepening socialist democracy and restructuring the economy. By that time, however, the bureaucracy had become too entrenched, careerism too rampant, the centralized model too embedded, resistance to change too deep, and resentment toward the Communist Party too widespread. In my opinion, it's not socialism, a system that puts people in nature before profits that is inherently flawed. Socialism is built by people who are human and make mistakes under conditions not of their own choosing. It's shaped by the activity of millions and those who lead it. Each revolution takes place under different conditions. There are no models, either for the path to achieve political power by the working class and its allies, or socialism's path of development. U.S. socialism will be far different based on our political and historical reality, the high level of cultural and material development, and our long history of struggle for expanding democratic rights, and I would add also the, um, uh, you know, the uh, ability to um, draw the, the lessons from uh, the experiences, global history of experiences of building socialism. U.S. socialism will be shaped by the conscious activity of the American people to expand economic and political democracy, overcome social, racial, and gender inequity, pursue a sustainable path of development, and demilitarize the economy and society. I firmly believe that socialism can and must be achieved peacefully and democratically through the electoral system. It will not be achieved through armed revolution, we're at the barrel of a gun. In fact, Frederick Engels, toward the end of his life, suggested just such a path in the late 1880s with the winning of the universal franchise by the working class. The day of the storming of the barricades is over, he declared. A lot of water has passed under the bridge since the October Revolution. We can draw lessons from this experience and experiences of all revolutionary and broad democratic movements, including our own. The last half of the 20th century, for example, saw two great mass movements of peaceful non-violent resistance. The movement for independence in India, led by Mahatma Gandhi, and the modern civil rights movement led by Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. A mass movement of the overwhelming majority of the American people who are conscious, perhaps unevenly so, of the need for socialism and working class political power can and must compel the capitalist class to accept a path chosen by the majority and restrict its ability to block their will by repressive means, including violence. Central to everything, in my opinion, is the struggle for democracy. 
the extension of political and economic rights, the growing engagement and participation of millions in political activity and civil society. This transition will pass through many stages and phases and comprise an epoch of reforms, leaps in development, and decisive turning, turning points, and it won't happen overnight. But there will be no social progress, no radical reforms or socialist society or ultimately classless communist society unless the power and domination of the extreme right and sections of the oligarch backing it is first broken. So I'll start with the Trump administration and the struggle to defeat it. This authoritarian, deeply corrupt administration with links to the so-called alt-right, the rebranded fascists and Nazis who exist both inside and outside the, the administration. Trump's recent spat with Senators Corker, Flake, and McCain demonstrates he and those forces Excuse around me, him, including the oligarchs, have for the moment defeated the Republican establishment. The GOP is his party. Republican elected officials are paralyzed with fear because Trump's base is holding steady and they fear a primary challenge from the right. In addition, the Republican Congress shares the same policy goals as Trump, but would prefer to use different tactics to achieve them. Trump is seeking to normalize conflicts of interest, violations of the Emoluments Clause, erosion of democratic rights, trampling over democratic norms, and the purveyance of pathological lying. The administration is dominated by white supremacists. General Kelly's attempt to revise Civil War history should dispel any illusions the public can rely on so-called pragmatic generals to restrain this president. This, this administration is also dominated by climate deniers, anti-science zealots, Islamophobes, and militarists. Altogether, they are driving an agenda based on ideas once on the political fringe, but now mainstream. The Trump administration and Republican leadership are supported by a mass base imbued with, indoctrinated with irrationality, lies, and conspiracy theories. They are being manipulated by an entire right-wing media and mobilizing infrastructure. Fox News, Breitbart News, uh, NRA, the uh, uh, right-wing evangelical church, and, and so on. This has the potential to develop into a full-blown fascist movement. The election of Trump prompted an unprecedented and broad-based resistance movement to defend democracy and the gains won during the Obama presidency. The resistance includes sections of oligarchs, much of the corporate mass media and national security foreign policy establishment. They fear Trump is destabilizing global stability, trade, and economic relations. On, mo on this past Monday, as as we know, Special Counsel Mueller issued the first indictments in the investigation into the alleged collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia to interfere in the 2016 elections. Most observers think that this is just the tip of the iceberg. If so, we are headed for a constitutional crisis. Either Trump, his family, and immediate circle and campaign operatives will be indicted for obstruction of justice, collusion and possible treason, money laundering and other financial crimes, or Trump will fire Mueller, a move the right wing is clamoring for. To defend democracy, constitutional and democratic norms, it's essential the investigative process takes its course and the public must demand it. 
Another danger is that Trump could also distract the public by launching a major military action or use a provocation to suspend democratic rights. This is very dangerous because the constitutional crisis and mass resistance to the Trump GO and GOP uh, has led to a political paralysis of sorts. And historically, such moments have been openings for authoritarianism and fascism. To defend, the, or the defense of democracy is key to addressing the issues of climate change and the nuclear danger and the other tipping point crises. This calls for the broadest possible movement and cooperation of forces possible to oppose Trump and the extreme right. The Trump GOP policies represent the most extreme oligarchs, the fossil fuel and military armaments industries, and reactionary social, social forces including religious fundamentalists and the so-called alt-right. During its eight years of obstruction of the Obama administration, the GOP presented no policy alternatives except no. Now they seek to impose reactionary policies that are intensifying and aggravating every crisis. For the crisis of wealth inequality, they offer a tax bill that will accelerate the flow of wealth to the top 1%. The policies pursued by the Justice Department are aggravating <coughs> racial and gender inequity and whipping up racism against immigrants and Muslims. Repeal and replacement of Obamacare would have stripped millions of health care, something they are now seeking with the open sabotage of the Affordable Care Act. Withdrawal from the Paris Climate Accords, gutting the EPA and reversal of Obama executive orders is making the federal government complicit in the climate crisis. Two developments best illustrate this moment and the dangers of right-wing authoritarian rule and the basic contradictions of capitalism. First is the humanitarian crisis gripping Puerto Rico. The victim of 119 years of U.S. colonialism and imperialist plunder and neoliberal policies have left Puerto Rico in shambles with over 40% poverty, high unemployment, a tattered infrastructure, closed hospitals and schools, and an unpayable and unsustainable debt. Self-government has been negated. The island is being administered as a colonial possession by a financial control board and the GOP-dominated Congress. And the Puerto Rican people have no say. They are denied the right to vote in presidential and congressional elections and to have federal representation. And that was before hurricanes Irma and Maria struck, whose devastation was magnified by climate change and the racist Trump policies. The extent of the damage is far from known, and it may be a year before all electricity is fully restored in decades to rebuild. Contrast the impact of hurricanes on Puerto Rico with that on Cuba. Hurricane Irma affected every province in Cuba. It was said to be one of the most powerful hurricanes ever to hit Cuba. Yet within a week, electricity was restored to the entire island. Schools and hospitals and the tourism industry were fully functioning. Meanwhile, Cuba sent hundreds of medical personnel to other Caribbean nations and Mexico. They offered help to Puerto Rico and Houston, but uh, predictably received no response. Cuba's hurricane preparedness and civil defense system is a world model. In 20 years, Cuba has been hit by 30 major hurricanes and suffered 54 dead. The second major development is the crisis 
on the Korean Peninsula and the growing nuclear war danger. North Korea has been subject to 70 years of U.S. imperialist encirclement. The U.S. military leveled North Korea and the war was never declared over. The country is surrounded by nuclear weapons, subject to constant threats and joint military exercises and sanctions. From their perspective, that is the North Koreans or the DPRK, development of a nuclear weapons program to defend themselves makes perfect sense. The DPRK sees the U.S. regime change efforts in Iraq, Iran, Syria, and Libya, and the entire history of overthrowing governments. But nuclear weapons development by the DPRK is leading to a far more da dangerous situation, including the possibility of a nuclear arms race in the region. 60% of South the South Korean public favors now the development of a nuclear arms program in response. And 70% of the American public supports the introduction of tactical nuclear weapons into the battlefield. The right-wing government in Japan at the behest of the U.S. bypassed its so-called peace clause in its constitution and is engaged in steady militarization. Both South Korea and Japan are being encouraged to arm themselves with nuclear weapons. The U.S., meanwhile, is pursuing a $1.2 trillion modernization of nuclear weapons begun under the Obama administration. It is being driven by the military-industrial complex and its insatiable greed. In response, both, or simultaneously actually, both Russia and China are planning their own nuclear modernization. This will propel the arms race to new heights and new dangers. There is no alternative but a peaceful solution, beginning with a full denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and a uh, denuclearization of weapons worldwide. <clears throat> and the United States must make the first move. Humanity faces its greatest existential threats ever in climate change and nuclear war, and Trump is aggravating both. Yeah. I want to focus for a moment on the issue of climate change. This is a crisis for humanity, and in particular, a crisis for capitalism. Marx wrote of the what he called the metabolic rift between society and nature that uh, merged with the rise of industrial capitalism. Capitalism is a system inherently hostile to nature because it is based on commodity production for maximum profits. And to achieve maximum profits, it must exploit labor and nature, the producers of wealth. In, doing, in so doing, humans are alienated from both their labor and nature. Capitalism can only exist through infinite economic expansion and wealth accumulation, which eventually clashes with the Earth's finite resources and ability to absorb ecological destruction. The American people are rapidly developing an eco-consciousness in response to extreme weather events. States and cities have pledged to follow the Paris Climate Agreement to reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, despite you know, what the Trump administration is doing. But this awareness do doesn't yet have a decisive impact on <coughs> politics. The climate deniers and fossil fuel industry have a lot on the federal government and remain a, a formidable obstacle as a, and as I said, the base of the extreme right in this country. And even if the U.S. fully sets course on a sustainable path, the effects of climate change in the immediate decades will still worsen. And the effects of the climate crisis will persist 
for years to come, long after all of us are gone. That includes extreme weather events, super hurricanes, heat waves, forest fires and deforestation, droughts, sea level rise, ocean acidification, and what is being called the sixth great extinction of species. <clears throat> as many as five billion people will be living in a radically different environment by the year 2050. Mother Nature is now playing by different rules. And as Al Gore said in his movie, The Inconvenient Sequel, Mother Nature is speaking far more eloquently than all of us combined. Consider this. The entire coastline of the U.S. is now threatened with sea level rise, not to mention, of course, what's happening globally. Um, in the worst case scenario, the entire state of Florida will be underwater, along with major metropolitan areas on both coasts. The hills of San Francisco will be a group of islands. And even if we achieve 100% car carbon neutral development, Miami, New Orleans, Houston, and other cities will be chronically flooded. And this is not some far off thing. It is happening now. And again, this is just the United States. The entire world faces similar disastrous consequences. It calls for both a sustainable path of development and societal adaptation to the effects of climate change. It will take the combined action and resources of society, and indeed all of humanity, to deal with this crisis. Necessity will force society to confront the domination of capital and the capitalist system, its profit motive, and anarchy of production and development. Basic survival will force a vastly expanded role for government, greater regulation of capitalist development, encroachment on property rights and profits, protection of natural resources, and the reallocation of social wealth. The demand for sustainable policies, resilience planning, and adaptation forms the basis of the transition to socialism in the United States. No one knows how much this transition to sustainability and adaptation, including lending solidarity to developing nations, will cost and how much social dislocation will occur. But it can't be avoided if we are to survive as a species. Take New York City, for example. Five years after Hurricane Sandy, New York City is undergoing a modest infrastructure transition to prepare for the next superstorm. This includes the building of a sea barrier called the Big U around Lower Manhattan and the raising of utilities 30 feet above ground. This will cost in excess of $100 billion. Miami is now spending $500 million to raise roads, bridges, and build seawalls and a new water system. This will have to be done in every community along the coast. Billions of trees will need to be planted to create a massive carbon sink and wetlands restored and expanded. Whole communities will have to be relocated. A modern electric grid system will have to be built Communities converted to renewable energy sources, water main systems replaced, mass transit built, homes and office buildings retrofitted to withstand extreme weather and conserve energy. Coastal development will need to be banned, which is an inroad into capitalist free market. Investment patterns will be dictated by the needs of society. Capitalist market forces leading to the liquidate are leading to the liquidation of the coal industry in favor of natural gas, sol solar, wind, and geothermal energy sources, all of which are cheaper. This is happening more rapidly than previously estimated. 
The solar industry already provides twice as many workers as the coal industry. The just transition to clean energy, demilitarization, a Medicare for all healthcare system will cause massive employment dislocation. However, transitioning to renewable energy, retrofitting the entire energy for energy conservation, building a modern infrastructure that also adapts to rising sea levels and extreme weather events, and uh, investments in expanding education, science and research, and of course a public health system will create millions of new jobs. The AFL-CIO at its recent convention and the Society for Civil Engineers are calling for four trillion dollars in infrastructure upgrades. But we simply can't replace what we have now. It has to be adaptable to the new climate realities. Such an infrastructure program will also address the massive loss of jobs that are expected in the next wave of automation which is being driven by robotics and artificial intelligence. The o Obama White House predicted that 47% of all jobs are at risk of elimination by the year 2050. Who will pay for this massive transition? Well, it's either going to be the people, you and I, or the 1%. Wealth well, con concentration has reached critical extremes. Okay. The world's eight, eight richest oligarchs <laughs> own wealth equal to the poorest half of the world's population. In the U.S., the top 1% own 35% of all wealth, and the bottom 80% own just 7% of the nation's wealth. This crisis of extremes can only be resolved <laughs> through massive redistribution of wealth from the 1% and a reallocation of federal expenditures. And that's exactly what's needed in this just transition. The single largest expenditure item in the one tri is in our federal budget is the $1 trillion uh, that's spent on military spending. And that does not include the $1.2 trillion nuclear modernization. This must also be transferred to fund adaptation and a transition to sustainability. So as part of this transition, we have to demilitarize the economy. The 2018 elections are critical for defending democracy and addressing the climate crisis and nuclear danger and other tipping point crises. This underscores the urgency of building the broadest possible resistance movement and radically elevating the fight for unity of our multiracial, multi-female, gay and straight, immigrant and native-born working class people. This is the only way to break the extreme right political stranglehold and open the way for the next stage in challenging in the challenging and complex transition to a peaceful, democratic, humane, eco-socialist society. Hey. 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 Do I just leave it open and let you all fight it out, or do I sit down? No, not yet. Just go ahead and take your questions. I'll be right back. To destroy this country. Yes, sir. Uh, the minute you mentioned, uh, not you, but in general, when you mentioned communist yeah. or socialist, a lot of Americans wince. In the outline, uh, the program that you outlined tonight, uh, isn't too much different from what I would imagine to be uh, New Deal Two, uh, carrying on. Franklin Roosevelt's uh, program in a time of great crisis, just like we're faced with right now. Uh, do you think that a lot of the problem that you and others of your persuasion uh, face is due to poor marketing, merchandising, 
brand name because the minute you mention communist, you're going to lose half the room. The minute you mention socialist, you're going to lose another third of the room. Uh, Bernie Sanders had a problem with that in, in, in many places in the United States uh, not too long ago. Uh, what's your feeling on this? Uh, should, should your party uh, or those who subscribe to that ideology use a different brand name? Well, you know, that's, a, that's, an, that's a great question. We should we repeat it, please. Oh, okay. Um, I, maybe I could, I'll just try to see if I can encapsulate it. He was asking, he was saying that um, we have a branding problem with communism and socialism, that, that there's you know, the level of anti-communism. People associate uh, communism and socialism with totalitarianism and nasty things. So the uh, question is, uh, and what I presented really is, uh, as he put it, uh, the New Deal 2.0, um, and it's very reasonable and most people would accept it, but once you start putting labels out there, people win. So, how do we deal with that? I guess is that yeah. fair? Okay. Um, well, we've had we've been having these this debate for a long time, and you know, um, our feeling is uh, well, there's a number of aspects to it. One is that yeah, it's it's true. The the anti-communism in the United States, anti-socialism is is part of the DNA, the political DNA of the country. And um, part of it is um, rooted in the mistakes of, I think, the socialist, socialist experiments of the past. Um, but part of it is also, you know, the lies and, and distortions and, and uh, hysteria generated by the uh, oligarch. oligarchs, yeah, uh, through the McCarthy period and, and so on. Um, what we're trying to do, well, first of all, let me let me say, I think that there's a there's there is a big change in how people look at these questions, and I think uh, it started during the Obama administration when he was labeled a socialist, um, and I think people kind of began having a shift in attitude uh, because of that, um, but also uh, Bernie Sanders campaign. Um, and that, I think, was a big, there was a big shift there. And you could see the emergence of actually millions of people who consider themselves socialists now, um, democratic socialists, whatever you want to call, call it. Um, it had a big effect, having a, a socialist run and being able to discuss it publicly uh, was really the first, I think, big, huge break in this anti-communist, uh, anti-socialist kind of atmosphere we've been dealing with since the uh, Cold War. Um, having said that, uh, and, and also I, I think um, what's also interesting is that in particular among young people, you know, you got over half the young generation who didn't come up in the Cold War uh, years and were affected the same way all of us were. Um, you know, th this doesn't mean anything to them. They're not affected by anti-communism and anti-socialism like older generations are. So that. That, to me, that's exciting for the future because they're going to shape politics going forward and everything, I think, will be different. Um, but having said that, I, I, I think it's still incumbent on, at least from my perspective, on our, our party and other socialists to present a image of a vision of socialism that's 21st century, uh, that's democratic, that's green, that is... Uh, rooted in democratic traditions and history of our own country, and but it's one that's modern and not uh, retro. It's not uh, based on models of the past and, and so on. And I think in doing that, I think we'll go a long way toward uh, hopefully addressing some of those problems, challenges that you mentioned. Okay. When you talk about the equality of the socialists, but the richest man in the world is Putin, and the Russian people are in poverty. Why yeah. is that? Well, I mean, they don't have a socialist society there. That's uh, That was overthrown in, uh, or when it collapsed in 1991. Uh, there was that uh, transition to basically a capitalist society there. And 
the reason that these oligarchs emerged is because they stole they stole the uh, wealth, you know, of uh, the social wealth that had been created by the Soviet Union and the Soviet people. They just yeah. stole that, and uh, uh, that's just gangster capitalism. And that's all that is over there. Putin and, uh, stole it. Putin stole it. He got all the money. What's that? Putin got all the money. Well, he's the richest. Yeah, among all of them, and he's the biggest gangster there is. Right? <laughs> you, know, so you won't find an argument with me. But that's not socialism. It has nothing to do with socialism. Nothing. Did you hear that? Yeah. And and by the way, I mean, I, I you know, that kind of gets into, uh, uh, you know, Trump and Russia and so on. And I think there, there's a few things that are happening there that have kind of emerged. One is obviously the kind of gangster financial relationships that Trump has with the oligarchs there, the money laundering, the criminal activity. Uh, you know, that's what they're pursuing. They're pursuing profits and greed and so on. You also have, um, you know, this, this class of oligarchs and they have their own interests and so they're pursuing their own foreign policy, including resurrecting a certain sphere of national influence, a traditional sphere of national influence. They're in competition with U.S. capitalism and other global powers. Um, so you, ha you also have that uh, that's, that's going on as well. And by the way, I, I think that the interference, and I, I believe that it, it happened. I have no, uh, no question about it. I think the question is whether there was actual collusion uh, we'll wait and see. My personal opinion is I think there was, um, but that to me that that's a gross interference in the affairs of another country, and it's a violation of sovereignty. We do it all. We've done it all the time, but that doesn't make it any. That doesn't make it right. It's wrong on both counts, whether it's uh, you know us doing it or somebody else doing it to us. Yeah, go ahead. But I don't want a, I don't want a camera. No camera. No camera. So my question is, I'm from former Soviet Union, and my question is, what, what's your opinion about Vladimir Ilyich Lenin? Oh, oh Lenin? Yeah. Oh, well, yes. I mean, I, yeah, I, the question is, what, what is my opinion about Lenin? Yeah. Uh, well, I think he was one of the, you know, great... Uh, Educator? Marxists, you know, of, and, you know, and, a, and obviously the... Main at that point, he, he was the main um, developer of Marx Marxism, uh, and, was, and of course was was also a, a strategic and tactical genius, um, and and helped to develop the strategy and tactics for uh, revolu socialist revolution. Um, and in, in addition, you know, really developed Marxism in a whole number of uh, ways. Um, and so, uh, you know, we. Of course, draw a lot on his ideas, and I think communists and socialists do worldwide. Uh, but he's not the end of it either, and there's a lot of new experiences that have um, been developed. And so, like Lenin, all, all of us who su subscribe to Marxism have to continue, have to see it as a living, a living body of thought, and have to continue to develop it, creatively develop it, and uh, apply it to new conditions, and, and so on. Would you agree that communism never really gave itself a, a chance because it just challenged the, the West on such a massive military buildup throughout the world that it just eluded all its resources and manpower and everything. It never really got into a, a, an economy that uh, proved that it could work. Yeah, well, I, I, I mean, I think one, for sure there, uh, that's true, and I, I've tried, I tried to outline that. Uh, the material conditions that it, it faced, you know, in uh, uh, the backward development. I mean, you know, Marx, when Marx talked about uh, socialism, he often thought, he, he thought that it would come, it would develop first in the most advanced industrialized capitalist countries. And here it came in through the back door, so to speak, in a very poor undeveloped country. And so that legacy was a weight around its next, and then in addition to that, of course, all the other things I mentioned in the Cold War and, and militariza militarization and the destruction of uh, uh, the country during both wars um, and so on. Um, but having said that, I, 
I don't think there that uh, there's ever been a there's never been a communist country for sure, and I would even argue that there's never really been even an advanced socialist country. Um, most of the countries even now are uh, like China and Cuba, Vietnam. Uh, say that they're socialist oriented countries. They have mixed economies and so on. So there, it takes a much higher level of development than what um, they have now. Just one more point. <coughs> Joseph, Joseph Stalin was the worst candidate to run the country. I mean, he created all this problem. They never really developed yeah, the economy. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. <clears throat> really, really destructive to Soviet and also global socialism. Um, go ahead. Here, in the back. Yeah. You know, uh, just a couple quick, you would know better than anybody, a couple quick follow the money questions. Um, Trump doesn't want to release taxes, and the oligarchs, I believe, are buying Trump properties or have bought yeah, the options. Yeah, that, that's the laundry. Can you explain that a little bit better? Exactly the follow the money of the um, of the uh, oil mobsters in Russia buying Trump Trump's properties because that that is the reason why uh, he doesn't release his taxes. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I don't know that? all the details, but you know, I think it's pretty clear that you know when Trump went through all of his bankruptcies back in the whenever it was the '80s. I, I was actually living in New York when all that happened, and he, you know, he really, he went bankrupt, uh, you know, the, his casinos went bankrupt, and he was on the verge of his uh, financial, financial ruin, you know, mm -hmm. but, um, as he had screwed so many of his uh, creditors that none of the American banks and institutions would lend him money. So what did he, what did he do? He went, he went and, to, and got money, uh, you know, where he could, through, uh, criminal means through money laundering and through uh, these Russian oligarchs and whatnot. Wow. That was the only place he could get it. Um, that's what will get him in trouble. Well, yeah, that's what he's, is that is collusion. exactly why he is <clears throat> petrified by this investigation. And that was that will, what the taxes will show? This yeah, well, that's partly what it will show, yeah. Yeah, he doesn't want to give them anything. Any, I mean, it's really gangsterism what he's involved in. And, um, I certainly hope he and that's why there, there's this fear that he's going to put an end to the, um, you know, to the uh, investigation. It's probably not so much even he cares about being president. It's about he, he doesn't want to go to jail for life for financial <laughs> crimes. <laughs> In this country, uh, voters lack ballot justice, patients lack care justice, citizens lack liberties justice, families lack quality of life justice, and workers lack workers justice. Uh, whether someone's a democracyist or an equalityist or a populist or a humanist or a democratic socialist or a communist or a revolutionary, it seems like your analysis is talking about the critiques of capitalism in its uh, failure of just enacting justice, which seems pretty reasonable to me. Whether I agree with you about communism or not, it seems like uh, it's always communists who are the most brave in pointing out the lack of justice in the American capitalist system. Thank you. I, I don't know if I, there's you know, I need to comment about that. Yeah, hi. Um, I, my question is, um, I've always wondered, I think there's a potential for a Supreme Court case to say that communism is almost like a religion. Politics is like religion. And that we communists have been systematically discriminated against, you know, terrorized, waged war on. And I, I wish we could just go to the Supreme Court and say this should be protected by the amendment, you know, that we're equal before the law. Has, have you ever considered anything like that? Or, and also, what are your plans for political? I don't, I don't really hear much about. Let's get the political party going. We've got some good candidates here, including myself, that love to run. Oh, really? What are you running for? Communist Party president. Oh yeah. <laughs> Whatever you know. Okay. Why not? Get in the news. Otherwise, we can't break through the media. Right. You know. Right. 
we're at the debates. You know, we've got the winning ticket, the winning policies. They're crooks, and so that's why they keep us silenced, right? Um, you know, uh, one other thing is I'm, I'm giving a talk on January about Carl Schmitt, Hitler's legal strategist, and I think the legal system has been rigged to, to you know, protect the corporate and um, hurt, you know, so legally we need to expose these fascists, right? Um, so, I don't know, how are we going to do it? Any ideas? <laughs> Yeah. Well, um, just a couple quick things. I mean, I just a little, you know, in terms of history, you know, basically during the McCarthy period, like the Communist Party was more or less outlawed. You know, uh, a lot of our leaders were imprisoned, and you know, for for the conspiracy for conspiracy to think, that's really what it came down to uh, for thinking. Um, and it was a long process to get to gain legality again. And finally, the party is a fully legal party, even though on the books, including here in Illinois, you know, there's that crazy law for running for office. You have to pledge loyalty, and you're not a member of the country. I forget exactly what it is. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it should. It's not legal. None of us would stand in, in a court of law. Um, but I, I think, you know, further games democratically, obviously, you know, we have to talk about, you know, the uh, court system and the fact that the Supreme Court now is dominated by the right wing. And until we're able to elect a uh, progressive government, you know, a progressive president, uh, or, or even a, a Democratic president that can begin to replace these right wingers with, uh, you know, uh, justices that are you know, progressive or whatever, um, but that's all part of this movement. That's part of what we have to do, you know, in order to make these breakthroughs. And that's going to take some time, unfortunately. Uh, but it's it's a necessary part of. It. That's why elections have consequences. They have consequences, you know. Uh, and what Trump's election had a consequence, and that's Gorsuch, among everything else that happened. So it's so important that we. Um, defeat these people, you know, uh, in the elections. It's it's the first step toward uh, much more radical reforms. But unless we do that, we're not gonna we're gonna we're not gonna be able to move forward at all. Um, and it's it's not enough just to be anti-Trump. You know, I think we all agree we have to we've got to develop a very unified program that can unite people based on economic and political uh, uh, demands. Uh, around health care, education, jobs, the environment, uh, racial and gender equity, and, and so on. Stalin killed 20 million Russians. Uh, do you really think he's an improvement over Tsar Nicholas? I don't think he's an improvement. The, Ru the Russian Revolution, uh, it's worse, right? Uh, well, you know, that's a hard, that's a hard, I don't, I don't want to argue it on that basis, you know. I agree, Stalin was, he, he was horrible for the Soviet Union, for socialism, um, and I, I have no, uh, there's no argument there. Um, but he, he wasn't, he wasn't alone, there, the Soviet people, that you have to separate him from what the Soviet people as a people achieved, you know, um, and and the 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 the, 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 improve, the way the system, you know, uh, brought improvements to people's lives. So definitely Stalin, to me, was the worst thing that happened there, um, and left uh, a horrible impact both there but also globally. But um, Socialism is still an advance for humanity, and uh, you know the legacy that socialism, even in the Soviet Union, left, despite all of the flaws, despite all of what Stalin did, is still something that um, humanity has to treasure. In my opinion. Okay. That, yeah, you said many times that uh, we have to defend, uh, defend democracy, or that you want to defend democracy. Yeah. So uh, here in the United States, yeah. Uh, so I assume you think that uh, this political system is uh, basically a democracy, 
you also said that uh, we should work through the electoral system, so I assume you believe in the system. Um, is that correct? Um, and if so, would you please define democracy uh, for us and uh, compare that to representative government? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, it, uh, you know, this democracy obviously is uh, a class democracy. It's capitalist uh, democracy. Uh, that is that it's dominated by the wealthy interest and capitalist class. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, there have been some rights, <coughs> many rights that have been won by the people, you know, that have expanded um, rights uh, that weren't, we, we didn't, we didn't have, uh, you know, at the founding of the uh, country. And even, even the, the uh, uh, struggle during the um, American Revolution, you know, it brought the Bill of Rights, uh, uh, which I think many parts of that capitalist class and slave owners didn't, didn't want. Um, and so it, it's, uh, it's been a struggle since then, you know, to expand these rights, whether it be in the Civil War and the abolition of slavery, um, the uh, uh, winning of the suffrage, the suffrage for women, uh, and extension actually of the right to vote to African Americans and Native Americans, Asians, and other people of color, um, the rights to organize trade unions, um, and now even now you know with the, uh, the achievement of Obamacare, even though it's limited, but the whole idea now that people feel that they have a right to health care, you know, is also an important development. But these are these are things that we have fought tooth and nail for. Right to expand, and, and it, you know whatever they they are, we have to defend. Them. That's what we have, you know, and that's the basis upon which uh, we're going to move forward. Um, they're imperfect. They're limited. Uh, they're even transitory to a certain extent. They've been taken away on occasion, uh, like voter suppression now and the, the efforts uh, to uh, for right to work and so on, um, but. We have to defend what we have, and we have to extend them. This is the uh, this is the basis upon which uh, uh, we're going to move forward. But we have to do it in such a way that it it uh, expands both economic and political democracy, and that means encroaching on the rights of of the wealthy, uh, capitalist class, their property rights. Um, but it also means enshrining. To me, it means. Uh, enshrining certain rights in the Constitution, whether it be the right to health care, the right to free education, the right to live uh, free of violence, the right to, to a clean environment, um, all those things, these should be 21st century rights, you know, that all, all Americans should enjoy. Um, so I think that's, we kind of, you know, we see it as a process, but certainly we can't, we can't uh, underestimate Know, what we've been able to achieve as far as rights are concerned. And also, by the way, just in terms of elections, yeah, there's a lot of other things that need to be done for fair elections, including removing money, you know, from the electoral arena. Um, you know, obviously expanding, you know, uh, reversing all the voter suppression laws, making it easy to vote for everybody. Um, you know, allowing. Uh, candidates to be able to run, like yourself and others, you know, who uh, shouldn't have to, to raise a million dollars, you know, to, to run for attorney general or for city council or something like that. Uh, so all these, there's a lot of democratization things that can be done to really expand uh, the electoral democracy and the electoral arena. Yeah, give me one more. So in, the, in that same spirit, uh, you seem to be suggesting that we work Within the system we have. So, do you continue? Do you uh, think we should continue with the two-party system? Or do you believe in any any form of third parties? Uh, no, I believe we ought to we ought to develop. I think a, a parliamentary system is, and even a what they call proportional representation system, is far superior to what oh, we sure have. Oh, But I mean, yeah. right now. Well, we have right no now. choice. Yeah, well, but do we have third we, we have third parties. Yeah. Well, I, you know, the problem is, is that the two-party system is what we have, and it's winner take all. Right. You know. That's right. That's so, the problem. yeah. So you have to. So, in my opinion, you, you have to um, recognize that and and uh, 
it comes down to really building the broadest coalition you can under one umbrella. And that, unfortunately, right now, that, that means the Democratic Party. Um, and if, if we have nonpartisan, where we have nonpartisan races, where independents can run, that's great. Where, we, where you have fusion politics, uh, like in New York and other places where you have Working Families Party, that's great. Uh, but most places, you, you know, you, like on a presidential level, you have a two-party setup. And until we're able to change that, that's the reality. And um, the problem is, how do you unite most forces possible, um, you know, against the extreme right, against the Republicans? And to have third mass third parties at this moment would split the vote, in my opinion. That's why, uh, even though I appreciate a lot of the things the Green Party does, for example, um, you know, they and other parties end up splitting the vote, and that that just uh, I think hurts uh, the unity of uh, our ability to have a unified vote, you know, against the right at this moment. Uh, once we we have more progressive people elected. And we can begin changing the laws, and we can open it up so we can have proportional representation. We can have parliamentary elections, and so on. But this is what we're. This is the reality. Unfortunately, this is the reality of U.S. politics. And you mentioned there's a nationwide effort to get progressives elected to be based for the Democratic Party to take over. In 20 yeah, yeah. I mean, mentioned that too. Yeah, I mean, there's you know even now there's a whole movement of thousands of people who are running on our revolution and. Progressive uh, all over the country. Yeah. Uh, you know, other organizations, the AFL-CIO is running, trade unionists, um, you know, there's a lot of grassroots candidates that are running, the Black Lives Matter has a uh, electoral arm now they're developing. So there's, <clears throat> there's this big movement, you know, of progressives to run, and <clears throat> that should be a part of this whole movement, you know, as we go forward. <clears throat> Charlie in the back, go ahead. Yeah, John, I was looking at your brochure here, and this young lady here on the cover, wouldn't, wouldn't she be better off putting on a nice dress and going to apply for a job instead of yapping on some street corner? <laughs> and the same thing with the guy on the next page. That is an <laughs> Are you saying we have a branding problem? <laughs> well, if you were to get ahead, ahead, you'll that get ahead. Cool. these people are just yelling They're about right, it. Yeah, Charlie. Yeah, yeah, complaining. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we'll do something about it. Okay. So, uh, what do you do every day? I mean, do you have a base? Do you work for the party? Yeah, yeah, I do. And how many people are members in Illinois and in the country who are paying uh -huh. dues? Uh, we have about, we're small. We have about 5,000 members nationally um, and several hundred in Illinois. Um, and we're, you know, we're, we're, we try to be, as active as we can in helping to build these coalitions, united coalitions between labor and community and social justice organizations. Uh, we're really active in the electoral arena. Uh, some of our members are candidates. Uh, generally, they run as independents or even within the Democratic primaries. Um, uh, we're active in the trade union movement, you know, trying to help organize. Um, so, uh, uh, and the main thing is, is said, building these coalitions on the one hand, but then we're also, we, we try to do what we can to message and to uh, uh, you know, bring our ideas and those of other progressive and left and socialists, you know, to a much wider audience. Um, we have a whole Marxist education program that we're doing. Uh, mainly, it's all online, but uh, lectures and discussions and whatnot. Um, so we're but those are the kinds of things we're trying to do. Uh, I spend a lot of my time, uh, you know, trying to build relationships uh, with other political forces, raising money, um, you know, helping to, to develop our po political approach, uh, meeting with new members and building clubs and organizations all around. Are you able to get into schools? Uh, occasionally, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, actually, what's what's good about, for example, with Skype. I don't have to go anywhere. I can just be in my office and talk to a class, you know, like I did a few weeks ago in, in Pennsylvania. I did another uh, graduate seminar at a university in Florida a while back. So it's like, you know, those are the kinds of things you can do. 
you nowadays. Yeah, that's a question in the back. Uh, Go ahead. My name's Luke. Uh, thank you, John. I thought you did a great job. Uh, simple question. Does the Communist Party USA believe in private property? Um, I mean, we eventually were for the abolition of uh, private property, you know. We subscribe to the idea that property is theft. And that's mainly, you know, like the, uh, <laughs> what, what uh, Marx was saying about, you know, the cap so that's part of the, so. That's part of the, the platform? Yeah, but um, we, see, we see this tra the transition to socialism, you know, that it'll be, we'll, we'll have a mixed economy for many years to come. Uh, there'll be private corporations and private property. You know, it's a transition. It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, but it also doesn't, that doesn't, uh, when you talk about pro property, a lot of people think, oh, communists are going to come and take my car, my home, my TV. My wife. That has not, that's not what we're talking about. Well, no, I'm just yeah. simply yeah. Philosophical, you know, as a belief that's part of the party. We're getting close to the end. You know, yeah. Obviously, Marx was against private property, and I, right. and, uh, I don't think, uh, I don't think uh, you're going to get anywhere, frankly, politically, with <coughs> Uh, the right to private property should be abolished. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, well, that, I mean, that is the goals that you mentioned, yeah. and that I think uh, people agree with, can be obtained and, you know, preserve uh, the rights of uh, property and the private property. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. During the time that the Communist Party uh, USA uh, was, uh, as you say, practically criminalized, uh, illegal, uh, did that have more to do with the party's close ties with the Soviet Union and the Soviet Communist Party than it did to any party ideology uh, practiced or uh, urged here? Uh, yeah, the question was, uh, did our the criminalization of the Communist Party USA have any have more to do with our ties, fraternal relations with the Soviet? Party uh, and support for the Soviet Union, as opposed to anything we did here. Right. Um, well, I think that was an element of it. Certainly, that the idea that the Communist Party was a foreign agent, um, and then of course you had the Rosenbergs, you know, uh, that were executed. Uh, so that was, and that still is a, that still is an issue that, that socialism is a foreign import, you know, it's foreign agents and so on and so forth. You know, like, uh, if you don't like it here, go to Moscow, you know, that kind of thing. So I think um, that's that's not as much of an issue. That's that's not, not an issue today because of the collapse of socialism. But I think in, during that period, that was a powerful argument that the right wing used uh, to criminalize the party. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Got the last question. Um, it seems like there's, uh, I don't know how many socialist organizations in Three. Dozens. Uh, the DSA has gotten a, a huge bump, you know, from the last election. Is there any effort to coordinate uh, efforts uh, between, since fundamentally, uh, you know, within a spectrum, you're all talking about the same thing? Yeah. Uh, or otherwise, or is it, or is it just, uh, you know, uh, sometimes it seems like, you know, if you work independently, are you at odds, or is it just to uh, work within smaller organizations? Yeah. The question uh, that he asked is, um, uh, is there an effort to try to, because there are so many different left and socialist and communist groups, is there an effort to try to work together and coordinate efforts? And, um, well, first of all, we're willing to work with anybody on anything. I mean, we, are, and as I said, you know, our whole approach is based in what we kind of call a united front, you know, against the extreme right. We want to we want to work with everybody who's against the right wing. We think that's really vital. Vital. If you're if you're willing to work against the right wing, we'll work with you. Um, and uh, you know, the, the the problem comes down to. A tactics, you know, because a, 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 there's a, a lot of, I shouldn't say a lot, but there's a big debate among a lot of the left groups about whether to work, either work in the electoral arena or work with the Democratic Party. We're one of those groups that, 
you know, we work in the electoral arena. We work outside the electoral arena. We work with the Democratic Party. We work in the Democratic Party, outside the Democratic Party, because that's where all the major forces are, the labor movement, the African-American community, the Latino community, women's organizations, environmental movement, and so on. They're all active, you know, to one degree or another, you know, the Democratic Party. So that, in, in a certain sense, that's a dividing line for a lot of these groups, you know, whether you're going to work on one side or the other. Um, the other thing is that we're right now, we're part of some, uh, I guess you could call it some left unity projects, you know, where we're working with different left groups. But, the, but again, it's mainly on this, it's called, by many of them, it's called the inside-outside strategy, you know. And so, and a lot of it's electorally, uh, focused. Uh, but we are, you know, working together. Uh, there's a limited number of groups, but we're working together. I mean, all of us are looking to try to expand that to more people. David's got the last question here that are going to rebuttal. So start preparing your rebuttals and get your hands up in a minute and we'll get a count. Go ahead. What's your question? Is one of the groups that you work with, I forget the name, but it's the one that puts out that news and letters publication and they're, they're, they are interested in the writings of was it Rania Dunyevskaya? Is that one of the groups that you? Uh, you know, I I know I know those folks, um, and like we we're in the same coalitions around May Day and so on. So on some on some issues we can work together, and we're we're happy to do that. But not obviously not everything. They have a different point of view on some issues, including electoral politics. I think they're more anarchist. Yeah. Okay. Let's give our speaker a big hand. Okay, now let's have a count here of who wants to give a rebuttal. The on deck circle is over here by the wall, by the post here. Start lining up here for the rebuttals, please. The only one good American. Okay, uh, who's, uh, let's have a show of hands. Who wants to give a rebuttal? And we'll take a count. Very good. One, two, Jonathan's three, four, David's five, six, seven, Eight. So there's only eight people giving a rebuttal tonight? Okay, then uh, we'll try four minutes like we usually do. Well, we're going to cut off the rebuttals at 25 to 9, so be aware. Don't if 10 people come up here expecting to continue it. we got to get out of here at quarter to 9 officially. So we start packing up about 25 to 9 while the speaker gets the last word. Okay, who's up first? That's 10. Okay, everybody gets four minutes for the rebuttal tonight. All right, 10. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Uh, what's your name again? I'm sorry. You're John? Yeah. Okay. Thanks for your very interesting talk. Um, I'm going to give a presentation on Stalinist Russia uh, in a few months. So I, I already studied this subject before, and, and I'm reviewing it. And I found some of your statements pretty interesting. You said it was uh, uh, the, the Russian Revolution, um, Communist Revolution, resulted in the first time working people were in political power. Well, that's, um, that's incorrect, to say the least. Um, the Russian Revolution did not result in ordinary people, uh, workers, even the proletariat, having political power. It was a dictatorship. Um, it, it was a dictatorship from the time of, of Lenin, although he wasn't the, the, the worst kind of dictator. Obviously, Stalin was an absolute, absolute monster, one of the greatest monsters if not the greatest monster in the history of humanity. And as one person said, he did literally murder, out and out murder millions of people, and also caused the starvation of millions more, especially in uh, the Ukraine, that, that area. of the, He had a war against his own party, his own party cadres, and also uh, against the, the um, peasants. Um, so it, it, was, it was horrendous. And I'm going to cover that. <clears throat> uh, later, uh, in a few months. Uh, the, pro the only progressive thing, or one of the few progressive things about the Russian Revolution was that it got um, Russia out of uh, feudalism, monarchy. So it was uh, a step forward in, in, uh, in the political institutions. Uh, mo monarchy is, is, you know, totally undemocratic. Uh, and so he, the, the Russian Revolution resulted in a sort of representative system, except that you only had one party to vote for. So it was, it was pretty hideous. Um, when, when I asked you to define um, democracy, I don't think you really did. Uh, democracy, 
like any other political system, is about a set of political institutions, uh, the locus of power. Um, in, in, in this system, we have an elective oligarchy. We don't rule, ordinary people don't rule, so it's not a democracy at all. And I've said that many times, and many of you have heard me say that. Um, so when, in lieu of uh, talking about democracy, uh, or our, or our per current system, like many other people, including many liberals, and in many ways, I'm sorry to say, I don't see you too different from just plain liberals, you went immediately to the question of rights. Rights are not democracy. You can have, in fact, the uh, Supreme Constitution had a, a long list of rights, a very long list of rights, okay? All constitutions have a uh, list a whole lot of rights. It's just paper. You might as well use it in the toilet, okay, when you don't have power. Um, so uh, neither uh, uh, the communist system or this system, which is supposedly you know, called capitalist, but it's just plain oligarchy, that is not democracy at all, and rights aren't going to win you democracy. Uh, why you kept on talking about defending democracy, defending rights? Why would we have to be defending our rights if we had power? We don't have power in this country. So that's one of some of the things I'm going to talk about uh, in later presentations. Thanks. You guys all want to call on her again. What's wrong with conference? Hi, my name's Ellen Corley. I've been coming here about half, you know, quite a few times now. Okay, four minutes. Four minutes. Yeah. Four minutes. Okay. Um, I thank you for your talk. I. Uh, kind of a come to the Communist Party um, late in my life here. Um, I was, I call myself adult child of the Republican Party. I was abused by the Republican Party on both sides. I've got a Newt Gingrich family and a Donald, a Milton Friedman, I am Rand family. Um, and then when the, the, cap, the Tea Party bimbo ran off with my stepfather, I, I started researching them and um, realized what the true colors are you know you can define democracy capitalism it all sounds good but like I read Ayn Rand I'm like where am I one of the parasites or am I a producer I don't know and um you know it things make more sense now that I am looking at it from I guess the Marxist point of view though I do think Marxism is can be confusing uh, I go to the ISO conferences and um, try to read it and but yet what's really I told last week um, I saw a sociology book that um you know makes sense that oligarchy right fascism this idea I think it's this guy Rothschild back in 200 years ago the Illuminati started financing both sides of the war that's I want to stop war I want to start exploitation and uh, so I read up on the deep state. Peter Dale Scott is my friend on Facebook and a whole bunch of people. So this is all history. They know, you know, these guys own the Fed, you know, um, private bank. We're not even allowed to audit them. Like the um, Supreme Court, we're not allowed in there. Basically, it is a, they're legally, we're, they're just picking you know, they just make us think we're a democracy. It really is just a face on, um, you know, oligarchy or tyranny, whatever. Uh, you know, and I, we have to do what Thomas Jefferson, Ben Franklin said, it's a democracy if we can keep it. You know, we have to be active. It's not easy because they control the media. Uh, but, you know, I am a strategic planner for brand advertising, and uh, I do think we can, uh, we can come up with a campaign that will win. The whole world wants us to. As we said at my fascism, refused fascism march today, humanity first, not America first, right? We're um, Pax Americana. It's, um, you know, Kennedy was shot because he was saying peace isn't about America first. It's humanity. We all know it, right? And um, it's, we just need, if we all say it, they're, the CIA isn't going to take us out like they took Kennedy and 9-11, um, you know, so that's why I'm a truth movement person. And uh, I think the truth will set us free if, you know, we just all have to say it. It's like an emperor's new clothes world right now. And um, 
That's why I come here. More free speech forums, more ways, you know, we have to practice speaking truth to power. So anyhow, I would love to, to run and help you develop a strategy. And I think the party needs to challenge these things in court. There's so many things that the guy Carl Schmidt I'll be talking about was a jurist that made, you know, was schemed and then secretly put into law how executive power, as soon as you've got a 9-11 or a Reichstag, you can, the, then they rationalize we're a security state, no more rights. Um, you know, we have to expose them for who they are. I do it on the internet, follow me, and let's do it together. All of us here, all of our lives, we've been look, uh, witnessing the struggle between communism and socialism on the left side. On the right side, you got capitalism, free enterprise, business community, and so forth. In the middle is government. Uh, I think what we need to do is try to find the right blend. One side doesn't fit all. We need to find the right blend for for, uh, for creativity and for equality of people. And here in the United States, we've got the best of both worlds. We have the best economies in the, in the world. Uh, capitalism works. Now, when I say that, doesn't work for everybody. <clears throat> Some people are extremely, extremely successful through capitalism. Um, but everybody, a lot of people can benefit from capitalism. These products that these people put out, whether it be automobiles, uh, computers, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and all those guys, we benefit from that. They benefit tremendously too. Uh, on the one hand, you have to leave this essence of free enterprise open. For those people that have the innovations, they can create things. On the other hand, you have to have, do have, have to have government regulation to fit in. But it's got to be the, the correct blend between the two. One size doesn't fit all. Um, the problem with we have, like, you have too much, let's say, business activity or capitalism. We call it capitalism. I like to word, say the word free enterprise. That's a more appropriate word for this. That, that's a fantastic concept for enterprise. People go out and create your own job, your own idea. You can do what you want to do. You know, you're not stifled by regulations and so forth. Uh, on the other hand, we have the safe, we're in the safety net for the people that just, just don't, don't succeed. People that are just failures or they just can't do it. So we gotta, we gotta find the right one somewhere. What it is, uh, I don't say I know it, but that's that's the search we should be doing. Because, like, especially in the United States, we go from election to election, we go from uh, left, left uh, uh, wing election one year, swing the, the, uh, the, the programs over the lab. Next year, next four years, have another election, go back to the rag, back and forth, back and forth. We've got to find some kind of a proper blend and, you know, create it for the rest of the world, too. It can establish something uh, like this. Okay. I'm going to ask you 10 questions. All right, here's number one. When the Cold War ended during the 1990s, should the U.S. military budget and global military presence have been reduced or increased? I said reduced. When the Patriot Act bill was passed, was it a violation of the United States Constitution as well as the Bill of Rights? No. Yes. Yeah. No. When the United States government waged the 2003 war against the sovereign country of Iraq, was it a violation of international law? I answered yes. When the Iraq war, was the Iraq war a waste of valuable human lives, valuable public budget, and valuable time, which could have been better utilized to address more urgent global concerns such as human rights, climate change, senior services, disability commercial services, poverty, health care, education, agriculture, housing, infrastructure, fair elections, work skills, training, natural disaster relief and rebuilding, after schools programs, libraries, civic services, high speed rail, public transit, parks, wetlands, greenlands, wildlife, nature protections. Yeah, but yes. Is the United States Supreme Court Citizens United decision which gave corporations personhood status an attack on the freedom of speech of we the people? I mean, yes. Yeah. From what several whistleblowers have recently brought to the attention of we the United States people, does the current government of the U.S. recognize and honor your and my civil liberties or ignore and violate them? I put they ignore and violate our civil liberties. 
Since there is enough food in the world to feed every human being on earth three nutritious meals a day is an example of incompetence or cruelty or a crime against humanity that the international powers that be are knowingly preventing food security for all. All the above. All right, good answer. Is Bernie Sanders the most popular member of the United States federal legislature? No. All right, well, sorry, I don't mean to quibble with you, but it's actually been polled, so this is not my opinion. He is. Currently in the United States, is there more socialism for communities of wealth and the ruling class, or is there more socialism for the communities of poverty and the working class? Wealth. wealth. Wall Street gets it. Main Street gets nothing again. The last question is, do you all like public parks, forest preserves, beaches, gardens, roads, fire departments, health clinics, post offices, libraries, schools, police departments, utilities, senior centers, disability independent living centers, public newspapers, public radio stations, public TV stations, veteran centers, streets and sanitation departments, sidewalks, bus and train benches and canopies, ticket windows and ticket machines, art centers, museums, newsstands, farmers markets, civics fairs, town squares, town halls, gazebos, bike paths, freedom of speech forums like tonight, outdoor concerts, recycling cans and garbage cans, street lights and pedestrian lights. No. Yes. In the 21st century, we the people in the United States have the freedom to make endless enemies. We have the freedom to hear the sound of the word freedom but not live it. Apparently we have the freedom to witness the government break international law. We have the freedom to waste our lives, money, and time on the opposite of what we need to live. We have the freedom to be deemed less human than a corporate cartel. We have the freedom to be illegally surveyed and harassed. We have the freedom to be hungry and starving. We have the freedom to watch our best and brightest be character attacked, censored, smeared, obstructed, gerrymandered, threatened, or assassinated. We have the freedom to have the fruits of our work funneled upwards to the already super rich and powerful, and we have the freedom to witness a government eliminate justice. Thank you to our speaker. Absolutely incredible. Our speaker tonight, and I mean every word of this as a compliment to him, our speaker tonight uh, enunciated ideas, goals, which could easily have been included in FDR's programs had he lived a little bit longer. Um, what we have here ought not to be labeled socialism, certainly ought not to be labeled communism because you're going to lose half the room uh, just with those two words. But, as I suggested earlier in the evening, perhaps New Deal Two, the second chapter. The deal is not done yet. The things that Franklin Roosevelt fought to bring about, many of them have become reality. Social Security, uh, a lot of programs which aid people even to this day. Some would call it socialism. I would call it the basic duties of a responsible country. This, if you want to call it socialism, fine. If you want to call it communism, uh, or at least whisper the word, fine. But the fact of the matter is, our government has a responsibility, regardless of what the current occupant of the White House has to say. Our government has a responsibility to, as Thomas Jefferson said, do for the people what they cannot do for themselves. Thomas Jefferson could not possibly have foreseen the complexities of life in the United States today. He could not possibly have foreseen uh, the uh, obligations <coughs> that a government today must take on, whether or not the present occupants of the White House like it or not. These are the responsibilities of a uh, a government that uh, took, looks to the needs of its people. These are the responsibilities any decent leaders, whether they be Republican or Democrat or Green or what have you, are going to have to address. Um, we're, seeing, we're seeing the beginnings 
of where that irresponsibility leads when we deny things like uh, global warming. We're seeing funny things happen, not so funny things, happening to our weather. We're seeing large numbers of people in certain cities along both coasts having an increase in things like asthma. This is due in large part to the fact that although we have pollution laws, anti-pollution laws on the books, they aren't always being observed as they were meant to be. The reason an individual like Donald Trump <coughs> came to power was not because of the fact that Americans are all closet fascists, not so. Because of the fact that both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party were asleep at the switch they had forgotten their basic duties to the American people. And along came a guy who talked good to a lot of people, convinced a lot of people. And, you know, you got to go back maybe 50, 60 years to another guy who was an illegal immigrant in Germany. He came from Austria. And he started talking a good game and people voted him in legally and they found out what they had gotten after it was too late. In the case of Donald Trump, and I'm probably going to get locked up one of these days for saying this, but I'll be in good company. In the case of Donald Trump, his danger is even greater than a died in the wool fascist. When, and I'm not, please understand, I am not endorsing what happened with the dyed and the wool fascists. When they came to power, they knew darn well what they were doing. The danger of the present occupant of the White House is that the man walked into the White House and he said, in effect, what do we do now, guys? I haven't a clue. And he didn't have a clue. Several weeks ago, when one of Trump's aides reportedly told him that if he was ever going to be removed from office, it would not be by impeachment, but it would be by the 25th Amendment. The President of the United States turned to this man and said, what's the 25th Amendment? Well, ladies and gentlemen, as we all know, I think we all know, that's the amendment that allows for the removal of a president who for mental or psychological reasons or just plain incompetence can't be allowed to continue in that job any longer because it's a job that he cannot do. We have a responsibility to make sure that we do not fall down into a pit of national insanity. I got to wrap it up. I think, I think you all know what I'm going to say next. Uh, see you at the impeachment party. <laughs> see you. Uh, see you. Why don't we lock her up? Yeah, lock, lock her up. Lock them both up. I would like Same to thank our speaker for a very informative <laughs> presentation. He did change the, uh, my idea somewhat of what a communist was like. He didn't call anybody comrade. He didn't seem to be following the party line. And indeed, in earlier times, when I was a boy in the early 60s, some of you may remember that Gerald Gardner came out with a book called Who's in Charge Here, which was one of the first books to take actual news photographs and add thought and word balloons to them to, um, to have some fun with the pictures. And one of them was a picture of Fidel Castro um, at bat in a baseball game, and the caption that was added had him saying, quick, nationalize the outfield. <laughs> so there was none of that here tonight, and I was pleased. With regard to this gentleman who said that, asked which was worse, Stalin or Nicholas II, having ancestors who fled Imperial Russia because of, of Nicholas's anti-Semitic policies, I think they were both pretty much just as bad, and that there is no little, little of any differentiation between the two. Thank you. Yeah.
About the war. And furthermore, uh, you know, when uh, when our troops were supposed to go from Kuwait to Baghdad, the newsmen were saying, once they get to Baghdad, they're going to meet the Stalingrad. And I turned around, like I turned around to you, and I started asking them, what did they mean? Nobody knew it. Practically all of them says I wasn't born yet. And that's the point. Now, this lady that is going to be running president for the Communist Party, uh, you should take the first step first. You should run for the Socialist Party and then Communist. The speaker was right. There never existed a communist country. It's only labels. Nobody achieved communism. Nobody. Not, not Russia, not China, but they all, they were calling themselves such. They were nothing but incipient socialist states. So forget about the title communism. Nobody, is, nobody was and nobody is communist. Nobody succeeded in that direction. Uh, in fact, in Russia, everybody's mentioning Stalin, Stalin. Uh, I, to, in my view, <coughs> Russia did not go through, through communism. The poor country really went through Stalinism. And, and that's a proper label to do. It was pure and simple Stalinism. Nothing, none of the principles uh, written by Marx and Engel uh, were really that much enforced or <coughs> succeeding to be a uh, real reality. Uh, you know, we have a world that uh, somebody here said that uh, everybody deserves three meals. Uh, you'd be surprised how many countries when somebody wakes up in the morning instead of thinking about edu educating themselves or getting ahead of life the only thing they think of what am I going to eat today and many countries are that way they are in what we call our backyard and we and remember we want to keep it that way and we do everything possible to keep it up oh turn it off i'm camera shy <laughs> oh you're almost done Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, you have many seconds? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, you know, one, one of the things I'm going to mention is everybody's seen Dr. Zhivago movie, right? Yes. Yeah. And we are biased. Remember that guy that, uh, of course, we were all sympathizing with Dr. Zhivago, great lover, was freezing here his ass, pursuing his lover. Forget about his wife. Yeah. And when they returned to his house, remember when they said that the commissar said, Oh, you are the owner of this house? And Dr. Hiwago said, Yes. How many were you living here? Three. 
Now there are 10 families living in here. And that didn't faze us. We were sympathizing with Dr. Rivago, the aristocrat, the good writer, the poet. Nobody ever seen a movie about any of those 10 families. How were their lives like that brought about the revolution? Capitalism has many advantages and disadvantages. But one of the prime advantages is that it's the most efficient way to allocate goods and services. That when you get a communist uh, government or e economy, as you have in China, they allocate according to corruption and uh, favoritism that they know the other person. And it's a very inefficient method. Um, the, uh, before we think of getting rid of, of capitalism, we had better um, remedy that particular aspect. Uh, each of us lives better than um, most of the people in the world tonight because of the efficiencies of capitalism. And uh, <clears throat> that uh, you should treasure what you have uh, more than uh, a dream of other things. Thank you. All right, where are you going? Hey, Mike, Mike, Mike's up. All right, let's go. Hurry up. You got anything to say tonight? Yeah, more than you. More than gibberish. <laughs> All right, so. Yeah, realistic <laughs> now. <laughs> um, got to remember that America started having problems <laughs> after right wing radio became the law of the land. Um, in the mid 90s, right wing radio came, came on very strong and has been very strong. And. About 100, pe 100 million people every day turn on their radio in the car and listen to these schmucks. <laughs> so we, they've been fed for decades right-wing thought and uh, anti-American thought, as far as I'm concerned, mostly. I agree with something they say, some things they say. Anyway, as far as Russia and uh, America, you know, I'm really thinking, uh, let's review. I really think when when Mueller or whoever someday busts Trump with the Russia oligarch oil mobster connection that they own him, I think that's going to be it. He's got to go. He can't be a criminal and be a president. So let's review. There's the Russian oil oligarch mobster connection for Trump. There's the uh, hackers from Russia that got onto Facebook and other uh, internet sites and polluted our election in uh, 2016. What is our other Russian connections with Russia and our election and how they own us? Could Are you it working be? on your presentation now? No, I want to review and get good. You got good feedback on how Russia took over our election. Well, don't you have this prepared? Because I got the two, the two right here, and then I believe the other uh, Russian connection besides the oligarch and oil mobsters owning Trump and the Facebook polluting. I believe is where Russia is um, infiltrated the politics of the right wing. And um, unfortunately, I think we're heading towards uh, a strong man, Putin, Chinese president type of democracy with a dictator, and something's got to stop it. Thank you. Thanks,
All right, good to see you, Howard. I think you're entirely mis incorrect regarding about capitalism does not care inherently. There's nothing in the structure for supplying any goods or services to the have-nots. Absolutely none whatsoever. There's no provision incorporated in the system. And until you correct that, don't give us lessons about uh, any other system being deficiency. And if you want facts and figures on that, boy, just look around. All right, some really eclectic here. By the way, thank you, John, for a nice. Yeah, uh, that really was good. You know, I'm going to be eclectic here. Um, what two countries in the 19th century was it legal to have a slave? United States. United States and Russia. Uh, Russia is a difficult place. I, it's difficult to ascertain if it's a country. Uh, well, first of all, um, there's some things here that I've heard many, many times that Russia was not industrialized. Um, French money in particular had been pouring into Russia under the Tsar. Uh, they had significantly built the Trans-Siberian Railroad. Uh, it certainly hadn't reached the level of other countries, but it certainly was on the road towards good scale, full scale industrialization. Actually, I mentioned this once before, the first railroad, amazingly enough, Howard, uh, in terms of providing services, the first railroad uh, under the Tsar was from his summer palace to his winter palace. Uh, <laughs> but it's difficult to ascertain. Uh, they were headed in some direction towards uh, change. It's difficult to ascertain if it's a country, what sort is it? Uh, it covers one-sixth of the, the, the geography of the earth. I think it has something like 200 languages or so how many countries is ascertainable? Uh, um, regarding Mr. Stalin, bringing these disparate entities together would take some doing. Uh, people, we live in, a, in really a modern culture. Other cultures don't get along especially European ones. There's distrust and hatred of each other, and they don't always get along. I, I call it continentals and things like that. Uh, the Russia under the Tsar was a theocracy, and the secular government that came in, the Tsar actually thought he was appointed by God, and God gave him the complete authority over the people of the country there. Uh, one thing I always like, Comrade Lenin, uh, and a very you know, interesting intellectual. Um, one thing about Lenin is he liked to listen to classical music, according to Beethoven. But then again, he stopped listening to it because it said he stopped listening to it because it said it made him soft. And we don't we don't want any we don't want anyone who's soft, you know. Uh, Cameron Stalin uh, certainly took the the country through the war. Um, I'm sorry, I. It, that was a unique situation in the history of mankind, what that country went under. And there's many, many things written pro and count on this, but they certainly took the hand in it. Uh, the other thing, you, you're a um, uh, no capitalist country. They, oh, this is the other thing. You said, oh, there's no socialist country. I hear this all the time from the libertarians. I, I, this, is not, this is amazing. I've heard this 500 times. There's no such thing as a capitalist country, a free market economy. The libertarians have said that 500 times. I've heard that. Oh, uh, let's see what else. The capitalist crisis. One thing I had a look at. I was reading the other day that, that like they haven't had a crisis in capitalism, a depression for a while. So it, it happens, I guess, all the time. This is a system he thinks is wonderful. But anyhow, that's it. Thank you very much. All right. All right. Yeah, you know, I'm not going to get soft. No, no way. Yeah. And then, okay, uh, I'd like to thank our speaker again uh, for a good presentation. Give him a hand. We'll get the last, uh, last word here in a couple minutes after my rebuttal. I'm going to try to add a couple of things that uh, the other speakers and everybody else hasn't added here tonight. Number one, 
Tom Hartman, the historian, uh, is on 11 to 2 in the daytime on 820, the progressive station in the Chicago. Tom Hartman has mentioned over and over again there, there's massive, overwhelmingly documented evidence from LBJ talking about it back then when Nixon was involved in treason. No Republican has gotten control of the White House since Eisenhower without massive treason and Ill illegal activity in crimes against the American people. Republicans do not get elected by the American people. Trump is the latest one that was not elected by the American people. That's a myth. 25% of the country, the eligible, the eligible voters, voted for Trump. Trump lost it to Clinton, and they changed the vote tolls in three states after we went to bed. That's the first thing. Number one, and then number two, this all this news about the Russian connection hacking our helping our the Russian connection has been blown all out of proportion. It's really like a gnat on the elephant's ass. The elephant in the room is that the American Republican machine is involved in massive voter suppression and trashing votes and throwing votes in the trash and everything else in 30 states. So we haven't uh, we haven't had an honest election in this country since 2000. The Supreme Court stopped the vote and puts George Bush in after he had lost it to Al Gore. In 2002, they passed the Help the Voter Act and started putting electronic voting machines in key places around the country so that they could control elections in key spots. So uh, we voted Janie, Dick Cheney and George Bush were voted out in a landslide in 2004. We went to bed, you know, claiming a victory, the Las Vegas odds makers called it, and we woke up in the morning after they changed the vote totals in 11 states. Said it was close, 52 to 48 percent, but Bush and Cheney are still in. In 2008, some of you may remember, if you're old enough, that the Bush-Cheney corporate criminal enterprise was the greatest criminal stretch of shoveling money to rich people in the history of the United States so far. We voted them out in a landslide, and it was such a landslide that the Republicans didn't have a hope of running against any Democrat in 2008. The public rose up in mass. A lot of so-called Republicans crossed over. They voted to put an end to that Republican corporate criminal enterprise. I mentioned, I, uh, those of you that, uh, that know me a while know I've been giving speeches here on Censored News. The Censored News catalog, the annual, comes out every October with the top 25 blacked out stories on it. Barnes & Noble couldn't get it last year until after the election because there was a chapter in there showing how the Hillary Clinton campaign made a deal with the media. The media told her, we will bury Bernie Sanders for you while he's winning nationwide. We'll report him as losing if you do good things for us when you get control of the White House. The sleaze and the slime of last year's election was the worst I've ever seen. And they're still saying, well, it was close, but Trump won. No, it wasn't. Trump didn't win. He was installed just like Bush and Cheney were twice. He was installed just like George. The Bush crime family ran this country from 1980 to 1992. Ronald Reagan played the role of the president, while Dick Cheney did the dirty work for eight years. Bush and Cheney, and then Bush took over for four more years. So we had 12 years straight years of the Bush crime family running the country, 1980 to 1992. Smedley Butler published a book in 1935, the most decorated Marine general in history. He published this book describing how war is a racket. All of these wars after World War II, everything the United States has been involved in is an exercise for our military to be so-called fighting for freedom when it's really the big corporations that are making money, 10 times as more profits as they would make selling clothes, shoes, and everything else at Kmart and Walmart. War is a racket that exists for the risk corporations. We have to face that reality and do something about it. I'm going to give a speech on this again on the, the updated censored news from 2018. That book just came out and it's loaded. If you can only buy one book a year or log on to the Project Censored website. But the, the 2018 edition is just loaded with stuff that would change this country overnight if the people would read that book and digest it and then get moving. Okay? Thank you very much. Our speaker gets the last word. Yo, get up here. Don't dawdle, we got an open mic. <laughs> Don't come up with a wall there.
Okay. Yeah, I was early. Okay. Yeah, actually, I wasn't prepared for that. I, I somehow forgot that you do have a last word. Um, well, this has been a really interesting discussion. I appreciate uh, you know the res the uh, thoughtful responses. Um, I guess I, I just wanted to. Uh, you know, just, I guess, say a couple things, of, again, about the right wing um, and the danger, you know, that they, they pose uh, to uh, democracy and actually to, you know, life on Earth in a lot of ways. Um, and, you know, part of the, what we're dealing with, I think, is uh, it's not only a political struggle, but it's also a, uh, battle of ideas, um, and the, the, the problem. One of the big problems that oh, I see is, man. you know, that you have this mass of like 63 million voters, you know, who were who voted for Trump. That's a huge number of voters, and um, it's true that Hillary got more votes, but the existence of 63 million people that voted for Trump. Uh, should tell us a lot about um, the scale of the problem that we're faced with here. Um, and there were, you know, I think there were obviously a lot of factors, you know, there's still a lot of analysis being done uh, about what led to that. Uh, obviously, you know, there's a lot of economic pain um, and distress, you know, among uh, working people. And, uh, but, you know, you have to, I think, also see um, this vote as uh, a result of uh, 30, 30 years of right-wing um, influence, you know, um, and using uh, tactics, strategy of dividing, you know, the American people along racial lines. Um, I think the uh, vote was a uh, reflection of the deep inroads that um, the right wing has made using racism uh, among white working people, among white people in general. I mean, when you take a look at the vote, uh, he won, Trump won among every category of white voters. Uh, so that tells you something there. Um, and among men, you know, two-thirds of white men voted for Trump. So that shows you the influence not only of racism, but also misogyny and sexism. Uh, but he, but, you know, this right-wing ideology of, uh, you know, kind of as a whole ideology that incorporates not only races, racism and sexism, but also uh, hatred toward immigrants, Islamophobia, homophobia, um, you know, hatred towards science and, and, and so on, irrationality, all those things, you know, they've had an impact. And forget who mentioned it, but the, uh, you know, beginning back in the, in the 90s, it's true, there's a new book that just came out called The 90s, which traces the development of this vast uh, right-wing uh, media infrastructure and, and actually uh, political infrastructure, you know, uh, that, that includes the emergence of right-wing talk radio during that period, um, the, uh, the development of these right-wing think tanks, uh, and uh, the, the uh, links with the social conservatives and the right-wing evangelicals, uh, the growth of the NRA, uh, all those things are kind of a constellation of uh, infrastructure, a right-wing infrastructure. Uh, and I know, like, my father lives in uh, near Dayton, Ohio, and I go see him pretty regularly. And when I drive from Chicago down there, the only thing that I can hear, practically, is right-wing talk radio all across Indiana. Well, you know, that, that's, that's reaching millions of people between that and Breitbart News and Fox News and, you know, all that. So we have a battle of ideas, you know? And I think the, 
the, the progressive movement, one of the, one of the big, one of my big uh, criticisms of the Democratic Party is that they abandoned, um, you know, whole states and districts. Uh, and even, uh, you know, parts of the white working class and uh, rural areas, um, small towns and, and suburbs and whatnot during this period. And so they, they kind of left wide open uh, these communities for right-wing influence. They, they didn't contest. They didn't contest at all. And so this is what you have. Um, we, have to, we have to contest these areas. We have to, we have to build movements and infrastructure in all these areas, red states, red districts. We have to build the labor movement and, and, its, and its alliances with all kinds of organizations. And, uh, you know the suburbs, the small towns, the rural areas, um, and, and convince, uh, particularly white working people who have been influenced by these ideas, these reactionary ideas, that their future lies in a united, united with the multiracial working class of people. Uh, that um, they're voting against their own self-interest uh, when they do vote for people like Trump. So we have a big job. We have a big job ahead of us, and uh, uh, it's going to take you know big, big movements and much bigger resistance than what we currently have now. That reaches much more deeply into uh, all kinds of areas that have uh, heretofore um, you know not not uh, been organized and, and so on. So anyway, I think this is to me this is the biggest battle for democracy now. It's the most important thing we have in front of us is to defeat the extreme right. Everything else, as far as I'm concerned, uh, unless we win this battle, you know, we're not going to survive as a people, as a world even. Um, and therefore, it's the most important thing as far as I'm concerned that we build the broadest kinds of alliances and movements possible, including in the elections coming up in uh, 2018, because everything else, talk, out your ass about socialism and uh, you know all that, but it means nothing, you know, without defeating the people. That's it.